In the last video, we talked about culture, co-culture, and prejudice. So in this video, let's start off by looking at cultural influences on communication. First, let's start off with individualism versus collectivism. So if you come from an individualistic culture, the focus is really on the self, independence, and personal achievement. If you come from a collectivistic culture, then the focus is really on group identity, harmony, and well-being of people who are part of your in-group. So when you think of an individualistic culture, think about those people who really want to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. That if I want to do it, I can achieve it. The focus really is on self-improvement, whereas in a collectivistic culture, it's really on we. How is the group benefiting from this? If you are part of an individualistic culture, going to college, and your mom and dad said, hey, we want you to become a lawyer, but you didn't want to become a lawyer? In an individualistic culture, you'd be pushed to do what you want to do for yourself. But in a collectivistic culture, you're more likely to do what's best for the group, in this case, your family. So if your family believes we need you to be a lawyer, you're more than likely to become a lawyer. Another dimension is uncertainty avoidance. If you're a part of a culture that's high uncertainty avoidance, you really value control and the rules. You don't really care for ambiguity. Tell me what it is and how I should follow it. If you're low uncertainty avoidance, you care less about rules and you really have a tolerance for changes, for some risk taking, and even diverse views. Some examples of some high uncertainty avoidance cultures include Mexico, South Korea, Japan, and Greece. Here, you tend to have more rigid rules and conventions about how to behave. Where some low uncertainty avoidance cultures include Jamaica, Denmark, Sweden, and Ireland. So there really is an emphasis on letting the future happen and not trying to control things so much. In the US and in Canada, it's fairly in the middle. There's an emphasis on, hey, let's do something new and exciting, let's make new technology, but there's also an emphasis on following the rules and having clear guidelines, especially in the workplace. Then there is power distance. If you come from a culture where there is a high power distance, then there's a clear recognition of status. And furthermore, there's more respect given to those in higher power than those in lower power. So if your boss makes a decision, you're more likely just to follow the decision because you need to respect your boss's status. Talking to him directly about your disagreement will be seen as rude. In a low power distance culture, it really is minimally different in treatment. No matter if you're the boss, no matter if you're a little bit lower on a totem pole, everyone's considered more equal. There's still differences as well, but it's very equalizing. So talking to your boss directly about your disagreement with the new policy is more acceptable in a low power distance culture. Be aware of how that plays out in the workplace. So if you're part of a high power distance culture, you're more likely to maybe accommodate or avoid conflict in the workplace. But in a low power distance culture, you're more likely to maybe confront the people in higher power, whether that be maybe more competitively, or maybe even seeking out compromise or collaboration. If you're thinking about different cultures, some high power distance would include Russia, Guatemala, and China. And some low power distance would include Norway, Sweden, Ireland, New Zealand, Denmark, Israel, and Australia. Now let's think about high context and low context. If you come from a high context culture, the emphasis is really on the nonverbal actions and situation. So if you're sitting in my classroom as a student and I say, hmm, 
That trash can is looking pretty full. Then, in a high context culture, you would start picking apart the clues. Well, my teacher, who is an authority figure in this case, mentioned that the trash can is full. So she probably wants me to take it out. In a low context culture, the emphasis really is on the words being said, by being more direct. So, in a low context culture, I would need to tell you directly, hey, so and so, take out the trash. Then there's emotion displays. Be aware that even how you display emotions is guided by your culture. There are different guidelines for when, where, and even how much emotion to show. This can vary between very intense emotion, being very open, or can maybe have you restrain a little bit more. A lot of Asian Americans will tend to smile when they're embarrassed, because that's how they are taught to handle that emotion. Those who are of Mexican descent may be a little bit more open in how they feel publicly. If you go to different cultures, you go to their funerals, for example, in African American society, being more open, really letting out whatever emotion that is, if it's extreme grief or it's extreme anger, that's considered culturally appropriate. So again, be aware of how culture is affecting even how you display your emotions. Then there's masculine versus feminine. If you come from a masculine culture, then your culture values competition, wealth, status, being assertive, and having achievement. So you're pretty much going to do what you need to do to win. If that fancy corner office means a job promotion and that you've been the best employee at your job, then you better believe you're going to do whatever you can do usually within reason, but you're going to do what you can do to win that corner office. Because again, it's a sign of status. Why wouldn't you? In a feminine culture, it's really emphasizing cooperation, caring for everyone, boosting the quality of all people. So in this way, if, again, corner office is there, but you know that someone else really needs the job promotion, Maybe they're down on their luck, or maybe they're taking care of a sick family member, and that extra money will be very, very helpful. You may back down and say, I'm not really going to compete for this job because I want to make sure that this person has what they need. Some masculine cultures include Japan, Hungary, Venezuela, and Italy. Feminine cultures tend to be in Scandinavia, and they include Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, and Denmark. If you're thinking about the United States, the United States is pretty masculine. It scores a 62 out of 100 on the masculinity index. Even how we view time is culturally regulated. Some cultures are monochronic. In this case, time is really a resource. Time is so important. How you manage it, or even how you waste it, is highly indicative of the type of person that you are. A good example of a monochronic culture is someone who has a schedule that's color-coded and even down to 10-minute increments of how they're going to use their time. You may know this person, you may be this person, where you even have scheduled free time. Think about that. Scheduled free time? Hmm. That's very indicative of someone from a monochronic time orientation. Now, if you come from a culture that's more polychronic, well, it's a little bit more flexible. The interaction that happens within a certain time period is usually more important than the time itself. You can't really spend time or save time or even waste time. A lot of P-time cultures include Arabian, African, Caribbean and Latin American countries. I know for me, I had a student who said that it reminded her of her Caribbean background because things were a lot more flexible. When I was in college, I went to my first reggaeton party with a lot of Central American students 
and the party was supposed to start at 9. At least, coming from a monochronic culture, I said, the party's supposed to start at 9, so we should be there on time. And I learned very quickly, people don't get there till about 10. Now, we've talked about all these ways that culture affects how we communicate and even how we view the world. What about how we can create intercultural communication competence? Remember to be world-minded. Accept others' expression, whether it be through their clothing or maybe even through their emotion display. Try to avoid temptations of ethnocentrism and comparative evaluation, where you say, well, my culture is better because... Are your cultures weird? Again, why are you comparing different cultures? It's just you're a different fish in a different set of water. Treat everyone with respect. I would say if you want respect, you should pretty much give respect. Be aware of attributional complexity. Understand others' behaviors have complex causes. So what you think is weird may actually have cultural significance for that person. Remember it's a perception check. So if you think, hmm, why would they do that? There may be a good reason for that that you can verify through that perception check. And always remember to demonstrate empathy, especially if you're thinking about maybe stereotyping or maybe even showing prejudice. Also be aware of communication accommodation theory. This theory really tells us that people try to adapt their communication to be agreeable to other people. That if you really want to establish a relationship with someone, you're going to try to seek their approval and adapt to their communication. So this may mean speaking a little bit slower to someone who speaks a different language so that you guys can understand each other. This may mean learning a few new words. It may mean being a little bit more considerate of how you use your personal space, knowing that in their culture, they have different rules. But this theory also lets us know that people tend to also reinforce differences and disassociate from others that they don't want to have a relationship with. So if you find yourself doing this, be aware that in general, people who have adapted their communication are usually perceived as being more competent. And then lastly, remember to embrace difference. As McCordnack states, difference doesn't mean distance. And as a former professor of mine once told us, we are more similar than different. So we keep thinking about the facts that just because we have these differences doesn't mean that we have to be apart from each other or have to think ill of each other that in some ways we're all human and we all have similar experiences that make us human, it will make us think more about how we can be interculturally competent. So we've talked about culture, co-cultures, prejudice, different ways that culture influences our communication and ways to be interculturally communication competent. I hope by now you understand why culture is such a complex issue and how it relates to our communication. So the next time you find yourself in somebody else's pond and maybe judging their culture, remember, it's all just water. <laughs>